Judging the history of Targaryen rule in Westeros is difficult because there are two distinct phases, and both are marked by the reigns of men great and vile. The second half of the Targaryen dynasty's near 300 Serenti saw them forced to admit that they were like their own subjects, because after the dance, they lacked dragons to back up their claims. This is not to say that Aegon's kingdom did not experience civil strife when his house did have dragons, but those were dealt with easily because, well, they had dragons. Though the first half of Targaryen rule was secured by their fiery war mounts, there was one whose presence inspired more hope than it did fear. Balerion was called the Black Dread for a reason. He spent half his life burning the castles and keeps of the Seven Kingdoms. Vermithor, on the other hand, was called the Bronze Fury, but became a symbol of the King's Peace, thanks to the wisdom of King Jaehaerys Targaryen. This dragon with great tan wings has a huge role in the Dance of the Dragons, besides being serenaded by Daemon Targaryen, and we're here to break all that down and more. This is Vermithor's Origins Explored. And spoiler warning, because there will be a lot of those in this video. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you, let's begin. Etymology Birthplace, Early Years The Targaryen naming tradition for dragons was never clearly that it was during the reign of King Jaehaerys as the names of his own dragon and that of his good queen were diametrically opposed. Alison named her dragon Silverwing following her coloring as Targaryen children were often wont to do after shifting to Westeros and becoming the royal house of the Seven Kingdoms. Jaehaerys showed that he had within him a true dragon when he named his bronze and tan hatchling Vermithor, presumably after a god of old Valeria. Vermithor's naming is a bit of an indicator as to the king's ambition and his future endeavors because Jaehaerys' father, Aenys, while a good-natured man, was not a good king. He was weak, timid, and did not understand why half of his kingdom was rebelling against him when it was obviously because of his disposition. In his youth, Aenys was sickly and it was rumored that he wasn't even Aegon the Conqueror's son. But that changed when he bonded with Hatchling Quicksilver. The first Targaryen dragon to be named after its coloring and disposition as opposed to a Valerian god or goddess. Quicksilver was the mouth of both Aenys and his firstborn son Aegon. While King Aenys died of a fever, his son Aegon the Uncrowned died in the battle beneath the god's eye when Balerion tore him and Quicksilver apart with ease. Balerion was being ridden by Magor the Cruel, who had usurped Aenys' throne precisely because he was a weak king. Magor's reign was short, last a bit over half a decade, but it was brutal and reminded the realm of the oppression that a dragon can bring to Westeros. However cruel and sadistic Magor might have been, there could be no denying that he was not weak. What Magor was, was childless, and because he was thought to be impotent as well, it was only a matter of time before his throne passed to one of his brothers' son. That son would end up being Jaehaerys, after Magor personally ensured the tortured death of Aegis's second-born son, Viserys. Jaehaerys had always been called wise beyond his years, even as a youth, and it is likely that he knew why his father and brother had not succeeded in claiming or even holding the Iron Throne. Consequently, naming his bronze and tan hatchling Vermithor might have been a conscious choice on the young prince's behalf, though we will never know if this was the case. What we do know is that Vermithor is the first dragon to be born in King's Landing. Up until this point, all Targaryen dragons have been hatched either on Dragonstone or in Valeria itself. Valerian had come to Dragonstone with the Targaryens as a young dragon. Vagar and Meraxes had been born on the volcanic island itself. Quicksilver and Dreamfire were hatched in the hatcheries of Dragonstone and given to Aenys and his daughter Reyna, respectively. And as Wave already mentioned, Aenys' son Aegon took his father's dragon after his death and Prince Viserys died dragonless. This makes Jaehaerys the first Targaryen princeling to have a dragon born to him in the capital that the Dragon Lords created. It also makes him the first in a long tradition as well. Upon Jaehaerys' birth, his older sister and eldest sibling, Reyna, placed a dragon's egg in his cradle. This egg would go on to become the hatchling that Jaehaerys named Vermithor. 
Reyna also repeated this process for his younger sister Alison, and her dragon egg hatched into Silverwing. Though we do not know if Reyna knew that this act would improve the dragon bond between her siblings and their dragons, we can assume that she did because Reyna is constantly described as having been a dreamy kid, more given to spending time with animals than men. It is possible that Reyna was a dragon dreamer and foresaw the hatching of Vermithor and Silverwing in their futures, which is why she placed their eggs in Jeharis and Alisan's cradles. Regardless of whether this was intentional or unintentional, it started a long-standing royal tradition of placing a dragon's egg in a Targaryen babe's cradle. Jeharis was the first of many. Vermithor's early years were spent moving from one place to another and often without the intention of doing so because of Jeharis' uncle Magor. The young lad had been born in 34 AC just eight years before his father Aenys would die and his uncle Magor would usurp the throne and live his early years on the run from his own Family. So naturally, wherever Jaehaerys went, so did Vermithor. After Aenys' cremation at Dragonstone, the Dowager Queen Elisa Valerian fled with her children to Driftmark, the seat of her father where Jaehaerys and Vermithor resided for the better part of a year before they were summoned back to King's Landing. Jaehaerys stood witness to his uncle's marriage to Tiana of the Tower and was sent back to Dragonstone alongside his mother and sister Alison as hostages of Visenya Targaryen. Vermithor bounced around from King's Landing to Dragonstone to Driftmark and back with a young prince he had bonded with. After Queen Visenya passed away, Elisa once again ran away from Dragonstone with her children, but this time, she went to a different stronghold. Storm's End had been the seat of the Durandan kings of old, but it was now held by House Baratheon. Oris, the scion of the Baratheons, was the bastard half-brother of King Aegon the Conqueror himself, which made his grandson, Rogar, Harris's cousin, and Rogar Baratheon also had something that Elisa's own lord father did not, the fealty of the entire Stormlands as their liege and lord paramount. Jaehaerys put forth his claim from Durin's defiance and many lords flocked to his banners. The High Towers, the Lannisters, and the Tyrells immediately backed his claim and even House Tully, which had been fighting against House Targaryen due to the Faith Militant Uprising chose to back their prince over his uncle. After hearing news of her brother's intent to march on the capital, Queen Rhaena Targaryen fled the capital and her husband on Dreamfire, but not before stealing Magor's sword Blackfire from him. Thus did Jaehaerys make his claim known before the eyes of lords and men. With the lineage of King Aenys, the sword of Aegon the Conqueror, his own bronze fury and his sister's silver wing. Lord Rogar was known to have said of his support for Jaehaerys that Magor had only one dragon, where his young prince had two. But his thirst for battle would not be satiated as the cruel king was found dead before he could take the field, murdered, some say, by the Iron Throne itself. The young prince landed Vermithor in King's Landing ahead of Lord Rogar's forces and claimed the throne that his father and his grandsire before him had ruled from. The Beast of Balance Vermithor's role in the early reign of King Jaehaerys I. By the time Jaehaerys landed Vermithor in the capital of the Seven Kingdoms, his dragon had already grown to become formidable by himself. Vermithor was called the Bronze Fury for a reason. He was an immensely strong beast and his fires burnt hotter than those of other Targaryen dragons. Even as early as 48 AC, he was the third largest dragon in the realm, only behind Vagar and Beleriand in terms of his size. And as the years passed, Vermithor only grew larger larger, which made him the perfect deterrent in service of the king's peace. Jaehaerys was determined to be the greatest king he could possibly be and knew that in order to keep the seven kingdoms in check, he would have to do what his father and older brother couldn't. Aenys could not exert his will as the king on his subjects as he was a weak ruler and Aegon went on his progresses without a dragon, which left him open to attacks by the Fate Militant. Jaehaerys did not intend to make either mistake. He knew that as a Targaryen, his first strength was his dragon, and he wanted to ensure that everyone else, foe and enemy alike, knew that fact. Thus, the king was never without Vermithor when he traveled his realm. Jaehaerys flew the Bronze Fury to Old Town after sorting out Magor's supporters in King's Landing. There, he was crowned by the High Septon, and he also managed to negotiate the disbandment of the Swords and Stars, granted the Iron Throne dispensed justice on matters of the fate. Jaehaerys returned to King's Landing and allowed his regents to take over control of the council, though he made it a point to always make his voice heard on all matters. The one thing that he could not prevent from happening against his will 
was his mother's marriage to Lord Rogar Baratheon, which is remembered in antiquity as the Golden Wedding. Not because he did not love Lord Rogar, but because he knew what sort of man he was. The king decided to flex his authority by arriving to his mother's wedding upon Dragonback, as Vermithor and Silverwing bowed their necks and allowed Jaehaerys and Alysanne to join their mother in celebration. After this though, the king decided to take agency in perhaps the most important of his political issues, that of his marriage, and his dragon was as crucial to this as his own wits were. Jaehaerys loved his sister Alysanne and wanted to marry her, keeping in line with ancient Targaryen custom. But the fate militants uprising had made Queen Regent Elisa Valerian extremely wary of continuing the practice of incestuous marriages. So she assented to Rogar Baratheon's assertion that both Jaehaerys and Alysanne need to be married and quick. Rogar proposed his brother Orin as Alysanne's husband-to-be and once word reached Jaehaerys, he acted quickly. Sending his king's guard ahead of himself to make the preparations, the young king took Vermithor to Dragonstone, followed by his queen-to-be. There, they were married in a secret ceremony witnessed by the garrison, Jaehaerys' king's guard, and both their dragons, but kept hidden from the rest of the world. Thereafter, Jaehaerys would seldom be seen without Alysanne, and though their marriage was not consummated yet, king and queen would often go flying into the skies over Dragonstone on their fiery mounts. Indeed, such was the affection that Jaehaerys and Alysanne bore each other that it passed on to their dragons, Vermithor and Silverwing, were known to coil about one another. And it is possible that their unions produced many of the Targaryen dragons that hatched later in his reign. Though that cannot be confirmed here. The king spent his minority on Dragonstone learning the histories, drilling himself to death when training at arms and preventing a civil war from breaking out once again when Rogar Baratheon decided to crown Arya Targaryen in place of Jaehaerys for his willfulness. For this act of treason, he was stripped of his chain of office by his own wife and sent back to Storm's End, where he made one last play for the throne but found himself defeated yet again. It was after Jaehaerys had become a man grown and taken his crown in full authority, sorted out his small council and made many other important appointments that he sent for his father by law. Rogar Baratheon appeared before his king expecting to be executed and wanted to be sent to Night's Watch instead, so you can imagine his surprise when Jaehaerys pardoned him on the condition that he honor his marriage vows and become his staunchest champion. It was when Rogar proposed giving his king hostages when he realized that he was not dealing with a mere boy anymore, for the king simply took him to Vermithor instead. The Bronze Fury had been feeding on boars when the pair arrived. Jaehaerys petted Vermithor and remarked that he grows larger every day before telling Rogar that he has no use of hostages, but the threat was evident enough for anyone with a half-brain. Dishonor me like that again and your house will burn. Rogar understood the message and remained faithful to his wife and his king for the rest of his life. Thus was Vermithor made King Jaehaerys' most important weapon on the field and in the council chamber, for no lord would be mad enough to defy a dragon in front of his dragon. When King Jaehaerys sent Septon Barth to treat with Sea Lord of Bravos, over the three stolen dragon eggs that Elisa Farman had purportedly sold to him. The Sea Lord claimed complete ignorance of any such transaction. Barth then reminded him that King Jaehaerys could give him a lesson on dragons himself, and the Sea Lord understood its meaning. When he returned to the capital, the hand of the king had managed to get the crown's entire debt to the Iron Bank of Bravos waved off which reduced the royal treasury's borrowings by half. Vermithor was also the king's chosen mode of travel for his many royal progresses, and during the reign of Jaehaerys the Conciliator, the Bronze Fury's wings went from Blackhaven on the Dornish marches to the Wall in the north, and from the Vale of Arryn in the east to the Arbor in the west. Vermithor brought Jaehaerys to his wife's birthing bed, or his newborn babe's cradle on more than one occasion for the king was fond of his royal progresses, and was a constant sight throughout the Seven Kingdoms. His appearance in disguise inspired peace at a time where one unwise step from Jaehaerys' end would have meant war once again. But as Septon Barth once wrote of him, it is a poor king who wages war against his own people. His grace was wiser than that. Vermithor and Silverwing are the only two Targaryen dragons to have made it as far north as the Wall during the reign of the House of the Dragon, and they alongside six other dragons were the only ones sighted in the skies above Winterfell until Prince Jaehaerys Valerian was sent to the ancient seat of the Starks by his mother as an envoy. But because the Bronze Fury and his Silver-Winged Queen were the beasts of balance during the Conciliator's reign, 
They hadn't forgotten their main purpose, and that was war. The Bronze Fury Unleashed, Vermithor's militant used by King Jaehaerys I. Vermithor was used in the field on two major occasions by King Jaehaerys I, but both of them hold such significance in Westerosi history that they immortalize him by his simple presence there. Of course, the Bronze Fury was arguably far more involved in the battles than the record keepers would like to admit, but that's only because they are the gray sheep of the Citadel. The first time King Jaehaerys Targaryen unleashed the Bronze Fury on his enemies was in the year 61 AC. Almost a decade into his reign, Jaehaerys was called upon by his father by law, Rogar Baratheon, with a request. The aging Lord of Storm's End could feel the stranger coming for him, and he wished to go out on his own terms. With his axe in his hand and a curse upon his lips, Rogar's rebellious brother, Sir Boris Baratheon, who had left Westeros to serve as a sellsword in the disputed lands, had returned home not to accept the king's peace, but to wage war. He had allied himself with a man called himself the New Vulture King, and using his intimate knowledge of the Stormlands, raided and looted the very place he once called home. Rogar wanted his king's leave to take care of his traitor brother himself, but got much more than he had asked for. Not only did Jaehaerys agree to his request, he added his own strength to his and brought Vermithor along for the ride. In what is remembered as the Third Dornish War, or Lord Rogar's War more accurately, Vermithor was both scout and vanguard, spotting the Vulture King's encampment in the Red Mountains of Dorne and setting them ablaze faster than you can say dragon. The king personally slew Rogar's brother in a trial by combat for he would not have him become a kinslayer, and was later heard to say that fighting in the war alongside Vermithor and Lord Rogar made him feel like a king again after the grief he had suffered over losing his daughter Daenerys to the Shivers. Jaehaerys would unleash Vermithor's bronze fury once again against the Dornishmen, but this time it would be two decades later and against House Martell directly. While Dorne had remained outwardly opposing to the Vulture King that Rogar and Jaehaerys brought down, not every lord in their sandy kingdom took the Targaryen's incursions into their territory lightly. Foremost among them was Morion Martell, and when Morion became Prince of Dorne, he intended to remove the stain of the Third Dornish War from his land's name by launching a fourth. For nigh on a year, he collected a fleet and gathered sail sails, pirates and corsairs off the Pepper Coast, and by the time 83 AC rolled around, Prince Morion Martel's invading forces were ready. He planned to attack Cape Wrath because it was Lord Rogar who had ventured into the Red Mountains and set his fleet upon the shores of the Rainwood. They did not even make landfall properly. Jaehaerys and his sons Amon and Balon took their three dragons into the sky and burned the Dornish fleet, leaving only haggard survivors or charred corpses for Lord Borimon Baratheon's forces. Vagar, Caraxes, and Vermithor's flames spread so quickly and burnt so hot that the Fourth Dornish War, as the Meisters call it, is also remembered as the War of the Hundred Candles. The entire conflict was fought and won in one day. The king returned to the capital with his sons and all their dragons and was greeted with a riotous welcome. That was the last conflict that Vermithor took part in as the Fourth Dornish War marked the height of Jaehaerys' reign personally and politically. Though Vermithor did fly the king to two consecutive royal progresses to the Westerlands and the reach from 87 to 89 AC, that would be the last time he did that as well. Thereafter, the Bronze Fury would languish in the stables, given over to his use at the Red Keep until the old king's death in 103 AC. Thereafter, Vermithor returned to Dragonstone where he had spent so many years of his youth and made a lair for himself in the smoky caverns of the Dragonmont. He would reside there throughout King Viserys I's reign after coiling with Silverwing, who was riderless as well following Alessand's death three years prior to Jaehaerys's. For a quarter of a century, the Bronze Fury went unclaimed, but the next time he would be mounted, it would be as a weapon of war, not a symbol of peace. Vermithor's Bronze Fury in the Dance of Dragons and House of the Dragon Vermithor re-enters the skies of Westeros not as the mount of a lordly nobleman, but as the steed of a humble blacksmith's son who has kingly ambitions. That's all the information you're going to get out of us with regards to his participation in the actual dance itself, but we're going to elaborate upon his participation as best as we can without spoiling anything going forward. As you might have noticed from the season finale for House of the Dragon Season 1, 
Vermithor is alive, kicking and ready to go to war. Damon sings him a high Valerian poem about the fire-breathing wing leader. Vermithor lets his flames loose in an arc. The two of them acknowledge each other and that seems to be that. It might confuse you to see Damon with Vermithor as well because doesn't he already have a dragon? And can't Targaryens only bond with one dragon in their lifetimes? But what we think you got a taste of with that scene was how castle dragons behave with one another. Recall that in the War Council after Rhaenyra is crowned queen, Daemon mentions that the Blacks have 13 dragons against the Greens, 3. But that estimation included all the wild and riderless dragons. Sea Smoke is on Driftmark as he was Laenor's mouth. Obviously, and Vermithor and Silverwing are at Dragonstone. He visits the old king's bronze fury to reacclimate him to human presence because over the course of some 25 years, Vermithor might have forgotten what having people around him feels like. He was said to be tolerant of the presence of men when he was Jaehaerys' mouth, but that was because the Constellator traveled frequently and kept Vermithor bent to his own will. Spending 25 riderless years would make even a castle dragon like him restless and suspicious of human presence, so a little poem in High Valerian, which is the only language that dragons seem to respond to, is perfect to reacquaint him with men. This is important because as you might have guessed, Vermithor is going to be one of the six dragons that will feature in the event known to history as the Sowing of the Dragon Seeds. In Fire and Blood, Prince Jacaris Valerian calls for Targaryen bastards and bold knights and nobles alike to try and claim the six wild dragons that were on Dragonstone for themselves. In exchange, he promised them lands, riches, and knighthoods, with their children being guaranteed nobility in their own lifetimes. Lord Gorman Massey, Lord of Stone Dance, and one of the oldest vassals of House Targaryen, died in his attempt to claim the Bronze Fury who eventually bent his neck to the aforementioned blacksmith's son. Together with his new force of dragon riders, the Prince of Dragonstone was able to better guard the Gullet, which has been blockaded by the Valerian fleet in the show, and Vermithor and his rider earned great victories beside him. However, as the course of the war ran longer, the baseborn riders of Vermithor and Silverwing became bolder, and after serving Rhaenyra for a time, they decided to turn their cloaks and join the Greens. This is where the Bronze Fury would live up to his sobriquet because in the final stages of the dance, Vermithor would emerge as the greatest dragon and the greatest dragon slayer. He effectively makes the last stand of the Targaryen dragons for them, and it is a bloody and cannibalistic one at that. With Vermithor's final decision to attack his own kind, the words of King Viserys will ring true that dragons are not a force men could hope to control, and his dying legacy would taint all the glory he had earned in his lifetime and youth. Vermithor was born the dragon of one king and died the dragon of another, who claimed to be a king, yet born of these personalities couldn't be further apart from each other, and in the end, the creature whose legacy would be tarnished would be the Bronze Fury. Marvelous Verdict The Legacy of Vermithor In the years after the Targaryens lost all their dragons, their throne would be decorated by the skulls of 19 of their one feared steeds. Vermithor's skull is not said to be amongst them for his remains were kept by the Lady of the Town, where he had died as a tourist attraction. While you might think that this is an affront to the memory of the old king, it is just as well given how thoroughly his descendants sullied his name. Vermithor was once seen as the pride and power of House Targaryen and their rule over the Seven Kingdoms. He was the tool that Jaehaerys used to reconcile them under his own authority. But after the old king's death, Vermithor became yet another reminder of how dangerous dragons truly are. Without a rider strong-willed enough to bend him to their whims or sage enough to know how to use the Bronze Fury, Vermithor was just as good as the cannibal, which is to say, not good at all. His final battle will be one of the bloodiest and most sordid tales of the Dance of the Dragons and will make us all grudgingly accept Viserys' assessment of his house's greatest power that it is an illusion and no one can truly know or tame the heart of the dragon. If you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone.